Good morning. Oh, hey, can I order a double espresso? Absolutely. I'll make one right now for you. Here you go. Thanks. What is this? Crema for ants? The crema must be at least three times as much. What's up everyone? Today we're talking all about crema. Crema for so long has been the signifier of quality in an espresso shot. So whether or not a barista is competent, whether or not the grind setting is dialed in, or whether or not the pressure of specific pressure or temperature was hit, crema in and of itself was what people used in order to understand or assume that a coffee shot was of quality. Is that relevant today? Well, I did a lot of deep dive research. I actually used quite a few books and academic papers in order to ascertain some information about crema, both crema formation, crema stabilization, sensory aspects of it. And surprisingly, there's not that much out there. Uh, Illy did some research both in a book and in a paper, which I'll have everything linked below in the caption. On top of that, there's a nice article in the Craft and Science of Coffee, uh, which I have uh, the book linked below as well. But outside of these few articles, which are kind of repetitive as far as the information that is shared between them, there's not much out there on, on this. So what I want to do today is I just want to take a look at how crema is formed, what we know about the stabilization and formation of crema, how it tastes, and then just have an under, a, a kind of a speculation as to what crema does today. What is its place in today's coffee culture? Is it necessary? Is it one of these signifiers or qualifiers of quality? Or is it something that we can kind of just toss to the side? Is crema important? Is it really as big of a deal as it's been said to be for over 100 years? Or is it time for a new understanding of crema? So let's jump straight into it. So essentially all crema is, is it's an Italian word for espresso foam. So it's the foam on top of your espresso, seen right here. Espresso is an incredibly complex beverage, more so than any other iteration of coffee preparation. What you have is essentially three things going on. This is very much boiled down, but you have an emulsification of oils. Now all the oil in espresso, about 90% of it is sub 10 microns in diameter, the bubble of oil, the emulsified bubble of oil. Then you have suspension of solids. So of course you have cell wall fragments and different fines that get through. Typically these bits are two to fine microns, but they can obviously be bigger than that. And then finally, we have an effervescence of gases. So in order to demonstrate this complexity, this tripartite complexity of the solids, the gases, and the emulsified oils, I have my glass of water right here. Now, first what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take some oil. And essentially we're gonna assume that this is the sugars, the acids, the proteins that are already in the aqueous solution. And we're gonna add these three things that really separate espresso. So we're gonna take some oil, it's just some olive oil. We're gonna dump it in there and you're gonna see how they kind of blob up, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna emulsify them. Essentially, I'm gonna make them into tiny little bubbles throughout the solution. Just like whenever water is going through the espresso puck at high pressure, it's able to get some of the those oils and it's able to disperse them into these sub 10 micron little globules. Okay, so I'm gonna take my little nano foamer and we are going to emulsify. So take a look at this. All right, emulsification complete. Nice. All right. Now we have emulsified those oils into tiny little globules, probably right at 10 microns, because I'm that good. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to take a suspension of solids, in which case I've got some coffee grounds. So I'm gonna take some coffee grounds. I'm just gonna do, 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 do. We're gonna take those and we're gonna suspend it throughout this solution as well. We're gonna take the nanofoamer and we're gonna just give it a little mix. Ew, look at that. Last, we're gonna get our effervescence on. You know I always have a bottle of this sitting around. We're gonna take that, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do this right here. We're gonna do this right here. And now we have effervescence of the gases.
So that's the visual representation of essentially what espresso is. It's a very complex tripartite beverage where you have the emulsified oils, you have the suspended solids, which can be the fines or the different cell wall fragments, and of course you have the effervescent gases inside. So all you gotta do in order to make this proper espresso is we do a little mixy matchy. We're gonna take that and mmm. We're gonna take some of the effervescence and we're gonna mmm. Oh, look at that. And then of course, now we have our espresso delicious looking. It's complex, it's got those globules all through it, which should give us a really nice texture because of course, globules, thick crema, that's what matters, right? Yeah. Delicious. All right, so crema. Here's a, here's a definition that I kind of like that we're, that'll help us kind of give a launching off point into uh, more specifics about what crema is. Espresso foam or crema in Italian is a biphasic, obviously meaning two phases. We have gases, we have uh, liquids. Biphasic system composed of a gas globules framed within liquid films called lamellae, the plural of lamella, uh, constituted by a water solution of surfactant. We're not 100% sure on these surfactants, but we know that that's kind of what's holding in place the crema. Now throughout the sitting process, as espresso is sitting there, the water leaks out and that's called drainage. And this is the initial flattening of that crema layer. So as, as espresso sits there, there is a lot of changes that happen incredibly quickly. It starts as a liquid bubbly foam and as it sits, it turns into a dry polyhedral foam. It's very intriguing as it sits there over time, as it dries out, and then it's just the surfactants kind of holding together that surface area. But over time, even that dissipates and you have kind of like a crust around the edge of your cup. That's incredibly bitter, left of that cell wall fragments, and then some of that kind of carbonized type of taste. It's kind of gross. But I digress. What we have with espresso is a quickly fleeting form of beverage that has a lot going on in it. And crema is kind of that topping. Now what I've thus far neglected to talk about is of course one of the greatest parts of it, which is those the gases that fill up the, 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 the crema itself. What gives it that fluffy texture. And this is the CO2. Now I do wanna do a brief tangent because I'm sure some of you might be like, well that's not proven and you would be correct. Technically there's not been nearly enough studies. The studies are scarce as regards the foam component in espresso. Now we do have a lot of research as regards the foaming uh, with carbon uh, uh, carbonated foaming like in soft beverages, soft drinks, uh, beer, things like that. But when it comes to a coffee, we don't have a lot of research at, at hand. And so a lot of this is, I guess, speculation, but there is enough crossover with these other beverage worlds that we can make a pretty strong assumption that carbon dioxide is indeed what is filling up the crema layer. So we have four key events in crema formation. The first thing that we have is the bubble formation, which happens with the pressure of that water column going through the puck of espresso and arguably those C the CO2 coming out and being introduced into our liquid aqueous type solution. And we have that a lamella. Okay, so we have the bubble formation and then we have the second thing is the raising of the bubbles and that looks like this right here. So kind of like in a Guinness or in a nitro cold brew, you have those bubbles kind of going up to the surface. This is an integral step in the process of creating crema. Uh, as the crema layer has stabilized, you start to have drainage. And this is where co the co a coalescing begins to happen. And then eventually you have a collapse of the crema. Essentially what we have is foam is a coarse dispersion of gas in a liquid continuous phase. That's what all of these, that steps one through four, that's kind of what it coalesces into, is this idea of a coarse dispersion of gases. And that's why we have that foam layer. Of course, we have other things in it, as I said, the aqueous solution, which includes the acids and the, the fats, the proteins, all that good stuff. We have the cell wall fragments that are scattered about. We have the surfactants and the lamellae. It's very convoluted, very complex. And again, that's why we can do a longer video. But for now, just know that it does not mean you have a good shot does not mean you have a bad shot if you have the presence or no presence of crema. It is completely person to person. I think it's a little silly that in the World Barista Championship there is still a point for whether or not someone has crema on their espresso, meaning there should be no hole, no shallow area where there is crema. Now, there, uh, of course, in the stabilization of the crema, you want to time and see how long it takes until you see a weakening of the crema. And then for persistence, the way that you, you check that, you can, you can take a scoop of sugar and put it on top and see how long it can hold the sugar until it breaks through. But again, this is more of a traditional way of understanding crema. This is understanding it based off of a nine bar shot. I wanna take one final tangent before 
before we, we close here. Now, when people talk about traditional espresso, they always go back to the nine bar shot, but I have a little shocker for you. The nine bar shot is not traditional. It's not. The traditional espresso was made with steam pressure rising up to one or one and a half bar back in the early 1800s. It was only patented in the late 1800s, but we have more than ample precedence of the fact that things were going on as far as espresso creation prior to the patent by Moriondo in the late 1800s. And then of course in the early 1900s, there's a little bit more efficiency, steam starts coming along and we get a little bit, just a little bit better espresso, but in reality it's sub two bar of pressure. But then we had, Espresso Savior Gaja come through in 1948, patenting the lever machine, which allowed us to create nine bar of pressure. And this is when we first really started to get stabilized foam on top. And this is where espresso has changed forever. But over a hundred years, we had already been creating espresso. We had been creating a concentrated beverage and it, it took a big change in 1948. So at that time, that was not traditional espresso. Somehow over the years, it has turned, the definition has turned and tradition is now going back to 1948, forgetting the years before that. That's not a bad thing, but all of this study that has been done is always assuming nine bar shots. It's assuming specific styles of espresso. It's assuming certain roast profiles. It's assuming certain thickness of cremas. And in the Illy studies, there's even an assumed density of the, of the crema, which is 0.2 to 0.4, I believe, grams per milliliter which is an assumption that doesn't necessarily hold true to all forms of coffee, all forms of espresso, as we talk about in this recent video I linked right here, which includes a turbo shot, a spro over, and all these different ways of making espresso or coffee from an espresso machine. So just keep in mind, Crema is something that we still have a lot of work to do on, in the science community especially, there's a lot more research to be done on espresso-specific foam. All we know right now is this much and there's this much to be known or, or even more. So there's a lot of work to be done. So keep that in mind. What I'm saying here may not age very well. There may be a huge breakthrough in a year after the posting of this video. So take that into account if you're seeing this in past 2022, okay? To conclude, I'm gonna end with a definition I really like of crema by Dickinson, which is crema is a metastable foam with a specific lifespan. It is effervescent like gas. It, it comes and goes quickly, and it is something that can be enjoyed greatly. But having a dogmatic understanding of crema, I think is where a mistake has been made. And I think we need to loosen up that understanding and know that coffee can be great without any crema, with a lot of crema, with some crema, with whatever that, with, with scraped off crema. Give it a try, have your own anecdotal experiences, Try everything, essentially is what I'm getting at. I, there's been so much push for a specific style of espresso for so long, and it is time now to kind of subvert that and go back to the roots of playing around. We had the steam pressure, one and a half bar, and it went to nine bar, and then we had the flat nine bar, but before that we had a descending pressure. So obviously there is a loose definition, a fluid definition of what espresso actually is. We don't need to be dogmatic about any of it. So go, have fun, try light coffees, dark coffees. Don't worry about the crema. If you love crema, all, all you need to know is get a really darkly roasted coffee. Also, there is no proof that conifora has more inherent crema formation than Arabica. So don't be stuck in just getting Robusta. You can play around, make crema on whatever you want. Just know dark roast fresh coffee is gonna give you the most crema. So if that's what you're looking for, there you go. Otherwise, don't worry about it. There's not even any proof sensorily that it, it, it uh, elevates the, the, the coffee. A lot of that is, again, anecdotal and is experienced person to person as shown in the panel that I linked below. Anyway, that's a lot. Again, if you want more, let me know. I can do a lot more of an in-depth course on it, kind of like some of my old espresso tutorial videos. Otherwise, again, hit that like, that subscribe if you enjoyed the content. Hit the bell notifications for whenever I post videos. Check out my Patreon. It helps me a lot to do, uh, to, to create better content. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you brew something tasty and cheers.